we have seen how to save data to a config file. Now it's time to see how to get it all when it's a bit more fragmented, how to store and restore the game state. The script works as such. We have two characters that are controlled with the arrow keys or with WASD. And I can use the load button to load the save game. If I press save, it's going to save the game to a JSON file. And upon pressing load, I can restore that state anytime. Here is how the JSON data looks like. We have the two characters and different data for both of them. The advantage of JSON is that we can nest values down in a hierarchy. So we not only have category levels, but we have any amount of levels we want down the tree. And this allows us to represent the game's hierarchy efficiently. We're going to save and load the game from the save.gd script. This is an autoload singleton like we did in the previous video. Now it has a method to save and to load the game where it's going to collect the data from the nodes in the scene and pass the data to the various nodes as we did in the previous script. Now the big difference is that it's the nodes themselves who are going to tell what data there is to save. For that, each node has to implement a save method. And it's in that save method that you return what you want to save from that node. On the second player, I've done it for you. It's going to return its position. And on the first one, we'll implement it ourselves. This one has a variable that doesn't exist on the other players. That's why we have to delegate the save method to the various characters or entities that have to be saved in our scene. Let's take care of the save data on the player in the save method. We want to return its position and its maximum health. We're going to store all the data as JSON on the disk. The reason is that Godot's dictionary have a method called toJSON, which is going to convert the content of the dictionary to a JSON string that you can save in a file. So let's add the keys to the dictionary. First, we want the position, and it's going to be a dictionary again, in which we're going to feed the X and Y coordinates. The reason for that is that in JSON, you cannot store a vector to directly. You can only store integers, floating point values, booleans, you should be able to store arrays and strings. The character's x position is going to be getPose.x and let's duplicate the line and change the x into a y to get the y position. And on top of that, we want to store the max health variable defined at the top of the script. So you can use that to export all your exported variables or even any variable like the character's maximum speed, for example. You could store it in your save games. Anything you want to store as part of the game. Note that you will have to decide on that. So expect your final save and load system to be different from this one. It's unique to every single game can store the max health that way. Note that when you define the dictionary with the Lua style, everything that's on the left of the equal sign is the key of the dictionary. You don't have to use quotes to define the key. And everything that's on the right is the value. So in that case, max health on the left is just going to be a string, but on the right side, it's going to retrieve the value from the max health variable. And that's it. We create a dictionary and we return it. That's all we need. Then it's up to the save script to make something out of this data. When you're going to define a method, I invite you to always try to write these steps either in pseudocode or uh, define what it's going to do sequentially. We're going to get all the save data from the persistent nodes. Then we'll create a new file store in memory. We're going to convert the dictionary we get from the player and player2 to JSON and finally write the JSON to the file and save the file to the disk. Let's start with getting all the data from the persistent nodes. Anything that's going to be saved should be put in a group. There are two ways to do that. One is to go to the scene that corresponds to the player in that case. 
select the top level node or any inside of it. We get the top node, click on it. And in the node tab, you not only have signals, but you also have groups. You can tag a node, put it inside a given group. And then from the code, you can retrieve all the nodes that are part of a group. I'm going to call mine persistent and add this node to the group. That's the way to define it from the editor. Now we can also do that inside of the script, inside of the player script instead. To do that, we open player.gd and in the ready function, we can add to a group and write the name of the group. The biggest difference is that in the code, we can define when the character gets added to the group. Well, if we do it in the editor, it will be available when the game loads, as soon as the player has been added to the scene tree. So let's do it that way. Now back to our save script. To get all the save data from the persistent nodes, we first have to get all those nodes. We can store them in a variable. And to access everything that's in a group, we first have to get the tree, then get the nodes in the group from that. We pass in the group name, persistent, and we can now loop over them. We have an array of nodes to loop over. Let's use a for loop to get them all one after the other. We want to call each node save method. It's going to be on the player and on the player two after that. And we want to store all of that inside a dictionary. So we have to create one. To add anything in a dictionary, we have to call the key we want to add and set it to the value we want to create. It's just like when you want to access a certain value using a key. The difference is that because the key doesn't exist yet, it's going to add the value to it. So in our save dict, we want to access some key and set it to what the save method returns on the node. The key will be the node's path. There are different ways to store the data and to load it afterwards. In our case, we're going to load everything at runtime with the nodes already existing in the scene tree. That's why we are storing the path to the node as the key. It's going to be quite handy because then we'll be able to use it to retrieve the player, the player two, and directly fill in the values. Another option is to get the node's file name and to instance everything when you load the game. We have all the save data. So now it's time to create a save file. And for that, we'll create a new instance of the file class. Once we have that new file, we can open some file on the drive. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're opening an existing file on the hard drive, but it can also be that you are creating a new file in which you're going to write data. That's what we're going to do. So we're still going to call the open method, but then we're going to pass in the write mode using the write constant in the file class. This file means that if there's anything in the save.json file, we are going to overwrite it. And if there's nothing, we are going to create a new file. Now, serializing the data is pretty much automatic for us as we have generated a, our dictionary. Inside the file, we're going to store a line. That's the name of the method to write a line. And we have to pass in a string. We're going to pass the save dictionary converted to JSON. This is going to create a JSON object as a string, and we're going to write it down in, a, in the save file. And now we have written everything to the save file. We have to close it. It's already written. It's going to be saved that way. Let's try that now. On my file system, I don't have any JSON file. Maybe you can see it. Let's launch the game and I'll press the save button to call the save function. And in the file system, the save.json file was written. That is because I'm using the resource file in the save path. So it's going to be saved to the save folder. Now we can open the JSON file to see what we get. We effectively get the path to the player node, player two and player one then nested inside of that a dictionary containing the position x and y and for the player node we get the maximum health as well we get our data exactly like we need it
In the load game function, we're first going to try to load the saved file. But if the player is trying out the game for the first time, there won't be any. So we have to check if it opens properly. And if not, we return from the function. It's going to be similar to what we have above. We have to create a new file object inside a variable. And then we should check if the file exists or not. For that, we have a method called file exists. We pass in the save path to see if that's the case or not. If it doesn't exist, we have to return out of the function. Otherwise, we're going to get an error trying to read it. To pass the file's data, we have to use the save file variable and then call the open method again. We'll pass in the save path as the path to the file. So we're going to load the game we just saved. And this time we have to pass in the read constant from the file object so that we don't write anything inside of it. Let's now pass the content of the file. That is to say, we're going to get all the text inside of it and convert the JSON back to a dictionary. Let's store it in a variable called data in that case and call the pass JSON method on it. We can call that method because data is initialized as a dictionary. And we'll grab the content of the save file entirely. For that, you'll use the get as text method on the file object. And now we have all the data, it's time to put it back into the node. Now it's slightly trickier than before. We have to use the JSON files hierarchy to find the nodes back in the scene tree. We're going to get the nodes from the dictionary's first round of keys. We'll grab the path to player one and player two and use that to get the corresponding nodes. Then we'll dive one level inside the dictionary and use again those keys to grab the values. We'll have to write some exception for the position as we have to convert the x and y values to a vector 2 to set the player's position. So let's start with a for loop. We're going to loop over all the paths that are available. Before all the node paths inside our data dictionary, we're going to grab all the keys one after the other. Well, we can get the corresponding node. We use the get node function for that, and we pass in the node path. Next, we go one level deeper inside the dictionary. So we have to get all the attributes defined in the JSON file. Back to the JSON file, when we pass this key, we end up with these rounds of keys down there. We basically dive into another dictionary inside the dictionary. And now we have access to the attributes, but we want to check if the attribute is the player's position. It's a special case. In that case, we're going to set the node's position using the corresponding data. If the attribute's name is position, then we uh, set the position of the node we got. This can be the player one or player two. We'll set it to a vector two and we have to construct it now. To get that vector2, we have to dive inside the data dictionary. And we have to dive inside of it from the start. So we first pass in the node path and then go one level deeper, passing the position as a key. And last but not least, we have to get both the x and the y values separately. That's how we're going to build our vector2. Let's copy and paste that and replace the x with y. If it's another type of attribute, we can set it a bit more easily using the set method. The set method is available on all the nodes and allows you to set an attribute's value based on its name. To get those values, you can go in the inspector and the path is always the category name slash the name of the value. But for our script variables, it's different. We just have to pass in the value's name. In that case, max health. And luckily for us, if we go back to the JSON one more time, we have set the key to max health to the same name as the variable, meaning that with the set method, if we pass in the attributes we have in our script, it's going to find the right variable for us and feed it a value of six. So we want to pass in the attribute variable as the string property that we want to find. And then for the value, we'll dive into the dictionary again using the node path. 
followed by the attribute. And there you go. This is enough to save and load data on the characters. To show you that, I'm going to modify the save data, maybe place the characters at a, a very extreme position. And you'll see when I launch the game that the values inside of the game and the position of the character will correspond to what we have in the JSON file. Now you can see the player's position didn't change, but if I start the game, I'm calling the load function at the start. And the player's health is now 10 instead of 6, but also both characters are placed on the left side of the screen because of the JSON data. Now uh, I'll move the characters around a little bit, save, and if I move them, when I reload the game, they are moved back to the last save position. This system is going to scale well for up to mid-sized games, games that take a few months, things like RPGs, for example. Uh, it's not the ultimate save game system. There are plenty of ways to approach the problem, and the way you are going to code it will depend a lot on the type of game you make. But this system is flexible and it's going to work in many situations. And for all your game jams and all that stuff, it should work very well. You can check out the previous video where we talked about how to save data with a config file. That's quite interesting to know because if you don't have too many values to handle, you can automatically save vector2s and all the built-in variables inside of Godot. With JSON, you have to do that extra step where you save the values separately. For example, colors, you'd need three or four values. With the config file object, that's not the case. Godot will do it for you. Don't forget to subscribe and to check out the Kickstarter if you haven't already. It's the last few days and we're almost at the ultimate stretch goal. So please help us reach it. Thank you kindly for watching and see you in the next one.